Four o'clock, so let's start uh, today's colloquium. Today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Matt LaHaye, uh, who is uh, from the Department of Physics. And, uh, Matt received his PhD in 2005 from the University of Maryland uh, at the College Park. And he, he was doing developing the radio frequency single electron transistor as a displacement detector, you know, which can detect very, very tiny you know, displacement, uh, <coughs> yeah, almost you know, close to the limit, uh, limited by the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Then after his uh, PhD, he went to the uh, Caltech to, you know, to do a postdoc with uh, Michael Rook's uh, group. Uh, and there, basically, his work uh, involved in first demonstration of the interaction between a superconducting qubit and a uh, nanomechanical resonator. After that, he uh, went to the you know, Syracuse University as an assistant professor. Uh, at the present time, his work is focused on the developing new hybrid quantum systems that integrate superconducting qubit, superconducting cavity, and the you know, mechanical, quantum mechanical oscillator system. Uh, this, you know, the hybrid system have uh, potential for applications to fundamental studies of quantum mechanics and the exploration of dissipation and energy transfer at the nanoscale. You know, now, uh, the title of the talk is uh, Mechanical Quantum Systems. Now, let's you know, welcome our speaker. Well, thank you, Simon, uh, for that nice introduction, and also for, for the invitation uh, to come out. We've had a really nice time today meeting both with uh, faculty and students. And uh, the, the added bonus also that it's, it's spring here, and you know, in, in contrast to what the picture shows there of Syracuse, it's actually really gray and brown right now, so it's nice to get out and see um, flowers and, and, and uh, green, green grass. Um, so as Simon says, uh, the, the title of my talk is Mechanical Quantum Systems. Um, and this is essentially the field that I've been working in uh, going back to the beginning of my career, you know, 15 years when I was a beginning graduate student. And it also encompasses um, the research I'm doing now at Syracuse. And so, you know, for me, uh, this field's been around forever. Um, and, you know, it, it's basically all I've known in terms of actual research. Um, but I also realize that it's a relatively new field and not everybody is familiar with it. So what I'd like to do um, you know, for the first half of the talk is just give an overview of mechanical quantum systems. And so uh, you know, I'll tell you what these are, give you some examples of, of what I mean by this, and then I'll give you um, some motivation to why are we interested in, in developing these systems, what are some potential applications. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what the challenges are, <clears throat> excuse me, what the challenges are in developing those applications. And then I'll spend a little bit more time um, discussing the state of the art in terms of meeting those challenges and also uh, pursuing these different studies and, and developing these applications. This will then segue into the second half of the talk uh, in which I'll focus on a particular type of mechanical quantum system that's received a lot of interest in regard to manipulating and measuring uh, quantum states of motion. Uh, the system is known as the qubit coupled nano resonator or qubit coupled mechanical resonator. Um, it's, a, it's the kind of system I've been working with uh, going back to when I was a postdoc, and it's the kind of system we're developing now at Syracuse. So I'll spend some time giving the background on these, these guys, and also tell you a little bit about our, our progress at Syracuse to engineer these systems. And you know, I, I tend to talk fast, so feel free to interrupt me if, uh, if I skip over something, or something's not, not clear. Okay, so um, you know, the field of mechanical quantum systems, or uh, it, sometimes also referred to as mechanical systems in the quantum regime. Um, it's, it's a rel as I said before, it's a relatively new field, but it's also a field that's expanded rapidly in, in the last decade. And it's expanded to the point where it encompasses a number of subfields within physics. So everything from uh, you know, gravitational wave detection to quantum optics, atomic physics, superconducting devices, nanomechanics are all represented in some way in this field. So it's a very exciting field, a very diverse, and so there are a lot of different motivations and types of systems that people are developing. But there is a common thread throughout all that research. And that is, namely, people in the field are interested in studying the quantum properties of mechanical systems that are normally well described by classical laws of physics. OK, and I realize that this is kind of a mouthful and kind of vague at the same time. So let me, let me be more precise here. When I say mechanical systems, 
I'm talking about several different kinds of things. So on the one hand, there are groups that are developing uh, structures that are very familiar to our everyday experience. Things like beams and bridges, cantilevers, or you know, a little bit more exotic wine glass-like structures, except for at the nano or micron scale. Okay. There are also groups that are working with more exotic mechanical systems, mechanical systems uh, nonetheless, things like suspended graph graphene sheets or suspended carbon nanotubes, uh, even acoustic uh, superfluid cavities. And then there's another category which I would call sort of regular old macroscopic objects, um, you know, things that you can see with your naked eye and, and, and touch with your hands, like these, these mirrors from, from the LIGO for, uh, collaboration. Okay. Before I go on, let me just say that this, these devices here represent um, sort of a thin cross-section of, of the field, of the type of systems that are, that are being explored. If you're interested in learning more and getting a more comprehensive uh, picture of the full scope of the field, this review from Air van der Zandt from several years ago is fairly up to date and it's also very, very comprehensive. It's a good review. Okay, so when I say these systems are, are normally well described by classical physics, what I'm talking about are their, their motional degrees of freedom. Okay, so for instance, these structures here, we know that they have spectra of, of vibrational modes, right? And we can calculate those mode spectra using continuum elasticity theory. We know uh, also that, you know, from elasticity theory, if we exert some kind of force on one of these structures, it'll ring and its motion can de be decomposed into these, these different modes, whether they be flexural modes or torsion modes, dilatational modes, etc. And so, for example, you know, one of these bridges here, nano bridges, nano uh, beams, if you were to pluck it and pull it in plane and let it go, it's going to ring primarily in its fundamental in plane flexural mode. It will ring with a frequency uh, that you can calculate um, that is based basically upon the geometric and materials properties of that bridge. Moreover, we can ascribe to it, ascribe to that motion about equilibrium an effective mass and effective spring constant. So at the end of the day, for small displacement of these structures, uh, they behave just like little masses on springs. They're basic, simple harmonic oscillators. Okay? And it probably goes without saying that, you know, under what we observe is that they behave as classical, simple harmonic oscillators. Right? So, for instance, every point on one of these structures as it's oscillating has a position and momentum uh, that are well defined and evolve in time as you would expect from, from Newton's uh, second law. The energy of one of these beams as it uh, flexes, it can take on a continuum of possible values. It just depends upon how hard you hit it, how often you hit it, how strongly connected it is to the, to the environment, how strongly damped it is. And as well, in any application in which these kind of structures have been used, you never see any kind of evidence of quantum superposition or quantum interference effects. Okay. So the normal state of affairs for these kind of systems is that their motional properties can be represented uh, by classical simple harmonic oscillators, mass, little masses on springs. Okay, but there's no reason we know of why if we wanted to, we couldn't use quantum mechanics to, to model the behavior of the motion of these systems, right? We could, for instance, for a cantilever like this, let's say we wanted to model the displacement of the tip as this thing's oscillating in its fundamental out of frame mode, like a diving board mode. We could invoke the, the postulates of quantum mechanics, require that the position and momentum of the tip be represented by operators that don't commute, could require that the time evolution of, of the system be governed by Schrodinger's equation, and then we would expect to recover all the characteristics one normally associates with a quantum simple harmonic oscillator. Right? So quantized energy levels, zero point fluctuations, where here the zero point fluctuations are sort of residual vibrations of the structure that persist down to you know, t equals zero. They're a manifestation of the uncertainty principle, right? They, uh, you, know, you can think of them as being uh, in, uh, inextricable uncertainty in your knowledge of the momentum and position of this cantilever. Okay. Another property that we'd expect to see for this thing, uh, which is not unique to quantum simple harmonic oscillators, but it's characteristic of quantum systems more generally, would be uh, superposition states. So in principle, given the right preparation and measurement conditions, quantum mechanics would allow for a cantilever like this to exist in a superposition of, of states, seemingly where it's at two positions at once, as sort of illustrated by this, this, this uh, cartoon here. Okay, so these are the kind of effects 
that researchers in our field are trying to observe in these systems. They're trying to take these, these objects that are very familiar to our everyday experience, that are well described by classical physics, and prepare and measure them in a regime where quantum properties, patently quantum mechanical properties, become observable. And what I'll show you in this talk is that at least one group now has shown evidence for the you know, quantized nature of the energy spectrum of a micromechanical mode. Another group has shown evidence for zero point fluctuations of a mechanical mode. What hasn't been done yet, but it's one of the, the holy grails of the field, would be to prepare some kind of superposition state, a macroscopic superposition state of one of these structures. If you could do that, then it opens up the possibility to perform experiments that could probe uh, really fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics in new, a new macroscopic limit. And by new macroscopic limit, I mean in a limit of you know, human engineered moving parts. Okay. So for instance, you can imagine performing new tests of decoherence or Schrodinger cat type experiments, except for with structures that are orders of magnitude larger than uh, with which such experiments have been done previously. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in, in, in that kind of those kind of questions, those kind of pursuits. There's also a lot of uh, interest in using these systems as a test bed for furthering our understanding of the quantum limits of measurement or the ultimate limits of measurement, specifically uh, the quantum limits of the, the limits placed upon the measurement of motion by by quantum mechanics. Okay, so there's a lot of um, you know fundamental motivation. There are fundamental questions motivating the development of these systems, but in the pursuit of develop, you know, pursuing those questions, those fundamental problems, we're also developing really exquisite sensing technology, uh, particularly in regard to the sensing of motion. And so there's um, a lot of hope and a lot of interest in then developing these systems uh, for for new, as technologies for for new applications, including uh, quantum information. And so actually, there's a large uh, amount of investment going on now. In developing mechanical systems to serve as elements in quantum information networks. And the specific role that they're being investigated for is to serve as a transducer to coherently shuttle information from spin and electronic degrees of freedom into the optical domain so that quantum information can be distributed to distantly located qubits. Okay? And right now, it's an outstanding problem in, in this field of how to coherently convert information from the microwave to the optical regime and back. But mechanical elements are actually a leading uh, candidate for doing that. There's also um, prospects for using these systems in different sensing applications. So if you have some kind of mechanical probe sensing technique and you're improving the resolution of that technique to you know higher and higher resolution, ultimately you'll run into you'll ultimately be limited in your sensitivity by quantum mechanics in the form of zero point fluctuations of your probe and quantum back action in the measurement process. The back action again is a manifestation of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, there's, you know, there's connections with gravitational wave detection. So the, gravita the LIGO interferometer shown here, um, you know, going beyond advanced LIGO, trying to enhance the sensitivity as much as possible, you could, you could imagine integrating ground state cooled uh, mirrors into the cavities to reduce thermal, the thermal vibrations and improve the sensitivity more. Also, you can imagine that what we learn in mechanics about manipulating and measuring quantum states of mechanical systems could be uh, imported into gravitational wave detection to manipulate and measure the light that they actually put into the inter interferometers to improve their sensitivity in those measurements. And um, you know, with the systems I'll talk about later that we're working with at Syracuse, uh, there's prospects for uh, studying with the resolution of single vibrational quanta, how energy is transported uh, converted between electrical and mechanical domains and how it's dissipated uh, in nanoscale and microscale structures. Okay. So there are a lot of uh, perspective uh, pursuits and applications, but right now these are just perspective uh, pursuits and applications. We're not at this point yet. We're, we're trying to get there. But the important thing is, it's just even in the last like five or six years, the field has made really uh, spectacular progress in being able to engineer the right conditions to start observing quantum behavior in these mechanical structures. Okay, and um, so you know this topic, or you know the challenges that confront uh, experimentalists in taking macroscopic systems in uh, preparing and measuring quantum behavior in those systems. It's an extensive topic, 
Um, on this slide here, I'm just going to briefly address three of the challenges, uh, three, three basic challenges that we face. If you're interested in learning more afterwards, I would uh, strongly suggest these, these two references here. Okay. So the mechanical systems I showed in the earlier slides, and also these systems here, the modes that people are interested in studying in were generally pretty low frequency modes, less than a gigahertz. So on the scale of megahertz, like the fundamental out of plane mode of this bridge here, or 60 megahertz, like the fundamental in plane mode of that bridge there. And so to really observe quantum behavior in these systems, it's in your best interest experimentally to go to very low temperatures, millikelvin and even colder. Uh, if you're talking about kilohertz modes, you have to go down to, to microkelvin temperatures, really, in order that thermal fluctuations uh, become smaller than your sort of characteristic quantum energy scale, the h bar omega or hf. Okay? So one challenge is we really need to get to very cold temperatures, millikelvin or microkelvin temperatures, in order to eliminate the deleterious effects of thermal fluctuations and washing out the behavior that we want to see. Another challenge is that uh, if you want to do displacement detection with sensitivity that's approaching the zero point fluctuations of one of these modes, then you need detectors who themselves, their, their noise properties are limited by quantum mechanics, so-called quantum limited detectors. Okay? So what that means then is you need to integrate these mechanical systems into either high Q optical cavities or superconducting circuitry, both which uh, under the right conditions have been shown uh, to be quantum limited detection schemes, giving you sensitivity in resolving displacement that's limited by quantum mechanics. And sort of the last challenge, last basic challenge that we face, um, I'll, I'll say more about this in a, in a little while, uh, but you know, to, to manipulate and measure quantum states of motion, or you know, quantum states of a harmonic oscillator, you really need uh, a detection scheme that's, that's nonlinear, something like a, a qubit. And again, I'll come back to that when we're good. Okay, but as I said at the beginning of this, this slide, the field has made a lot of progress in, in recent years in, in meeting these challenges. So, um, many of you are probably familiar with this result. So this slide shows the first demonstration of the cooling of a mechanical structure, a mode of a mechanical structure, uh, down into the quantum regime. Okay, and this work is from uh, Andrew Cleland and, and John Martinez's groups at uh, UC Santa Barbara from back in 2010. And the, the structure that they, were in, that they developed is this micromechanical cantilever, shown right there. And they weren't actually studying like one of the flexural modes of this structure. They were actually interested in a, a breathing mode, a dilatational mode. It's a mode where the structure is uh, expanding and contracting. And in this particular case, it did so at a frequency of about 6 gigahertz. Okay. So what they did was they took this device and they put it on a uh, cryogenic refrigerator known as a dilution refrigerator, like the one uh, Ceylon has in his lab, and they cooled this system down uh, to 25 millicalvin. Okay? At that temperature, they, sh they showed that at that temperature, the thermal occupation factor for the system, basically the ratio of thermal energy to the characteristic quantum, was on less than 0.1. At most, it was 0.1. And so what that meant is, is that at most, this mode here was spending uh, or at least this mode was spending 90% of its time in the quantum ground state. Okay, so they had effectively cooled this system down so that it was sitting in the lowest level of that harmonic oscillator energy spectrum. And this, this was a milestone for the field. This is the first demonstration taking sort of an everyday classical mode and putting it into a regime where you start to expect to be able to see quantum behavior in one of these systems. And what they actually, what they did after this was even more spectacular, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. One of the points I want to make first, though, is that this is actually a demonstration of uh, passive refrigeration, right? So they took their sample, they put it on a refrigerator, cooled the refrigerator down, and then through various thermal couplings, they cooled down this mode here. And the reason this worked was because the frequency of this device was six gigahertz. So that means to get this, you know, to get to freeze out, to get the ratio of thermal fluctuations to the vibrational quanta to be one or less than one, you only need to cool it below 300 millikelvin which is readily achievable using a dilution fridge. But as I said in the previous slide, most groups in the field, for various reasons, use mechanical modes that are much lower frequency than this, on the order of megahertz, uh, even hundreds of kilohertz, tens of kilohertz. And for those kind of frequencies, you get to go to temperatures that are just not accessible with a dilution refrigerator. Importantly, though, the field has developed a technique to cool even megahertz and kilohertz range mechanical devices down into the ground state or close to the ground state 
and it's based upon something called back action pooling. So I'm not going to get into the details of back action pooling. You can read about it in this review from Marcus Aspelmeyer, which is now in uh, the Review of Modern Physics. Um, but the, the gist of the idea is as follows. In each of these images here, you have a mechanical element and you have an electromagnetic cavity. And so, for instance, here you have the mechanical element is a, a, micro, grid, a micro drum head. And it's one half of a parallel plate capacitor, which is integrated with uh, a planar inductor. And this is all superconducting. So this is like a lumped element LC circuit coupled to a mechanical device. In this uh, plot, or this figure on the bottom, you have a nano bridge clamped at both ends. And in that bridge, uh, you have a photonic cavity that's integrated there. And that couples to the strain, the, the breathing, a breathing mode of that, of that uh, structure. And in this case, it's really, probably really hard to see. You have a high aspect ratio mechanical beam that's capacitively coupled to this gate here, which is an electrode that leads to a microwave cavity. So in each of these examples, the electromagnetic cavity serves two purposes. It provides a displacement detection of the motion of the mechanical element with nearly quantum limited or quantum limited sensitivity. And two, through the measurement process itself, it actually exerts a force on the mechanical element doing work on it and cooling it below the environmental temperature. All right? And so this process has been wildly successful. A number of groups, more than just the three shown here, have been able to use it to cool their mechanical devices down well below ambient temperatures of their, their cryostats and uh, into the regime where the mechanical mode has very low occupation. Why, why does he... So, so this, this bar is going to do work on the refrigerating. The, actually, the cavity does work through the measurement process. The cavity is actually doing work on the mechanical element, damping it. So it's exerting a force. It's basically, the classical picture of it is it's exerting a force that's out of phase with the motion and causes it to damp down. The quantum picture is running together. Does not that heat up the mechanical element then? Is it you can. You can have both processes. You can, depending upon how the detuning and frequency uh, between how you drive the cavity and the uh, sorry the detuning of, yeah your, the frequency you choose to drive the cavity its relationship to the cavity center frequency if you're uh, detuned at higher energy you can excite the mechanical element if you're detuned at lower energy you damp it and it's actually Raman, Raman scattering if you're sending in a photon at a, for cooling you send in a photon at a lower frequency it gets up converted to a higher frequency by a uh, phonon so you're taking a phonon out of the mechanics good question. Okay, so this has been this is a really important development for the field because it's enabled uh, a whole variety of different devices to be able to be cooled down into the quantum machine, and people have now started uh, to do really cool experiments to start looking for signatures of quantum behavior in these mechanical systems. And just to list some of the ones in the last couple of years, um, again, you, you know, cooling down a micromechanical drum head resonator. This group at NIST uh, showed evidence for entanglement between the mechanical motion and the microwave, the electric field of the microwave inside this lumped element LC circuit. The group at uh, Caltech uh, showed evidence for the zero point fluctuations of one of these breathing modes of these structures here. And uh, group, uh, Keith Schwab's group at Caltech, um, uh, using one of these cavity cooling techniques and cavity measurement techniques, uh, they were able to uh, implement a displacement detection scheme that uh, gets around the, the back action that's normally mandated by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So so-called back action evasion measurements. So you can perform measurements below the what's usually uh, the uncertainty principle constraints you to. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you at this point that the field has the technology uh, to cool these devices down into the regime where you should start to expect to see non-classical behavior and they also have displacement detection that's, that's nearly quantum limited. The next question is, how do you prepare quantum states of motion of these systems? How do you prepare and measure quantum states of motion of these systems? Uh, things like number states. You know, how would you prepare it in one of those latter states, a harmonic oscillator? How would you prepare a superposition state to measure it? Um, and so as you can imagine this is a technically uh, challenging task. And as it turns out that you know, to prepare and observe most quantum states of a simple harmonic oscillator, you can't just use uh, a linear displacement detector. And before I explain why, let me just make sure uh, I'm clear what a linear displacement detector is. So such a detector is one in which you know, the electrical or optical output of your detector is linearly proportional to the motion 
of some mechanical device at the input. Okay, so you have some mechanical object that displaces, couples the input degrees of freedom here, and you see a modulation in the output in whatever domain that is that's linear, linearly dependent on the input. And I, I think everybody probably realizes this, but most displacement detection techniques that we have, especially for sensing small displacement, uh, are linear. Okay. And the problem with linear displacement detection is that um, because of the a specific interaction between the mechanical device and the input degrees of freedom of the detector, the measurement process actually projects the mechanical element into a coherent state of motion. And so, uh, as many of you probably know, a coherent state of motion is very hard to distinguish from a classical state of motion. Okay? So an oscillator, a harmonic oscillator in a coherent state will have a position and a momentum that on average, over time, follow Newton's equations. Okay? So if you use a linear displacement detector to measure a quantum harmonic oscillator, on average you'd see the position and momentum of a classical oscillator. Okay. So the question arises then, well, what do we do? Most detectors that we have are linear displacement detectors. Linear displacement detectors give us classical behavior. How, how do we actually do things like prepare number states or superposition states? And so this is a problem that people in my field started thinking about 15, 20 years ago. And what they realized was that the fields of cavity QED and ion trap physics, uh, quantum optics had, had an answer for this. And so this, this is an example from, from cavity QED. Um, so at, in, in cavity QED, the researchers like Sarah Jaroche, uh, Jeff Kimball, had pioneered techniques to use individual atoms as probes of electromagnetic simple harmonic oscillators. And so this cartoon uh, right here it will illustrate a, one particular technique they use to detect the number states of a microwave cavity. And so the idea is, is that you drop uh, atoms one at a time through the microwave cavity, and then you are, they do some uh, sophisticated atom interferometry to arrange things so that when the atom exits the cav cavity, it's in one of its in internal states, electronic states, um, serves as a proxy for the number state of the microwave cavity. Okay, so if this atom is in this ground state of this, uh, if that would encode n equals zero, it would mean that the cavity is in the n equals zero energy level. If the atom exits in the excited state, it means that the microwave mode is in the n equals one level. Okay, and so they can sit there and they can draw a train of these atoms through the cavity one after another, which is shown here, and repeatedly measure whether or not their microwave mode is in the n equals zero state or n equals one state. So they can effectively see it undergo these quantum jumps in the energy of the mode. What do they see, that radiation from the signal atoms? They see a transition from the signal atoms? They actually do, they're looking at a phase shift, so they have some super, the atom in a superposition of the two states, and they actually uh, encode the information about the number state and the phase of the dynamical evolution of the atom as it passes through the cavity. Well, what's, what's, the, what's the apparatus? Um, it's, what, what, are these, what are these bars? What, which bars? Does it look like a time series? Right, so each of these little blips here is a measurement of the, the atom state. So these little the blips here, are where the, they find that the atom is in the ground state, and each one of these is where they find that the atom is in the excited state. These are repeated, so these are individual measurements uh, of the different atoms sent in one after another through, through this microwave cavity over the period of seconds. So there's is there, hundreds. Is there another microwave that queries these atoms? And, uh, you, you see some of them. Yeah, so there is some noise which um, gives them uh, counts, uh, false counts of excited state when, they, when it's actually, uh, or the false counts of n equals 1 when it should be actually be n equals 0. But, yeah. but what, I mean, the point is that they're using, they're developing, um, they're using the internal states of the atom here to serve as a proxy to read out the number states of, of the, this microwave. And the, the, you know, this is just one technique that's been used. This is actually a rather old technique from back, or result from back in 2007. Um, I know I, I've lost track of what the state of the art is in it now, but I know the last I'd seen they were able to use a technique similar to this to read out up to n equals five. And actually, to use project, it's a projected measurement. They could actually prepare the, the number state of the cavity mode as well. So they could prepare and measure up to n equals five to the microwave cavity. The details of how they do the interferometry, I. I, I can't reproduce right now, but, but I mean, you can't see it's a quantum jump when it takes a second and a half. And so the time scale on your graph there is it's no. I don't. I don't think there. I mean, so the jump doesn't take a, a second, second and a half. It happens between a measurement here, which is on the order of 
of milliseconds or hundreds of microseconds. But the, so you know, it's, the it's like an ordinary photoelectric effect, except that you're doing it down by up. I, I don't think it's actually a photoelectric effect. I mean, so the, the, the coherence times of the atoms are on the order of 100 milliseconds or, or longer. So, you know, the atom would. Uh, the relaxation times of the atoms are on the order of 100 milliseconds. So you would expect it to exist in, uh, in a given in a dwell time in a given number state would be on the order on this this time scale here. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, he just gets, he drops the move, uh -huh. gets excited, and you read out that he was in an excited state. It's actually not that. It's actually it's a dispersive coupling. It's not a resonant coupling between the atom and the cavity. So the as the atom passes through, and I'll give an example of this. Maybe we'll clarify it later. As the atom passes through the cavity. The cavity actually shifts the phase. It, it changes the energy difference between the, the ground and excited state, so that you see a shift in the phase of the uh, between those two different components of the state. And then they read that out using it as interferometry. That's what I've been asking you. What they read out? Okay. You say, you say they shift. It shifts the phase between two states. Yes. They observe something. Right. They observe something from the atom. That's kind of the. Optical or micro. Yeah, they then there's excite the atom afterwards. I don't know. I don't remember what the very last step. So there's, is. there's some yeah. there's some subtle deal that they see in the transition, which allows them to get some information about these phases. Uh, yeah, there's another. There, I think there's probably a. Third, they, I think they ionize the atoms at, in the final step. And, um, I, I I can't remember. It's not. Yeah. The, yeah. So the main the main point of of the slide though is that these individuals have developed techniques. Not just for me measuring number states of one of these microwave modes, but also for doing things like preparing superposition states or Schrodinger cat states of the, the atom and the cavity, and also doing things like tests of decoherence and teleportation experiments. So the, the, the mo this motivates the question then is there some analogous device in solid state physics uh, that we could use for measurement and manipulation of the quantum properties of the nano resonator? Uh, and the answer is yes, a superconducting quantum bit, qubit. So um, about 13 or 14 years ago, uh, Keith Schwab um, had realized that you could take a superconducting qubit, uh, specifically he was thinking of a Cooper pair box charge qubit, and I'll say a little bit more about the details of that in a few slides. But he realized you could take one of these devices and integrate it on a silicon wafer uh, with a nanomechanical resonator, and then establish a really simple electrostatic interaction between the two systems, basically apply a voltage between and at the end of the day, you, had, uh, you would arrive at um, a, a description of the system that's formally analogous to um, an atom coupled to electromagnetic mode. Okay. And so, just like the, the example I showed on the previous slide, of an atom coupled to the microwave mode. And so Keith and Miles Blanco and Andrew Armour worked through the details of this, uh, this system in these papers here back in 2002. And in the subsequent years since then, um, Literally, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of proposals have been put out in the literature that map onto the system many of the beautiful techniques uh, and experiments from cavity QED and ion trap physics, quantum optics. Except here to try and uh, explore the quantum properties of these mechanical devices. And so, you know, in principle, on paper, these systems look like they could serve as a test bed for studying uh, quantum mechanics in, in a new macroscopic way. And you know, giving further weight to that promise is the fact that uh, you know, researchers in, in the field of superconducting quantum computing, like the CELON, have shown uh, many times, or repeatedly, that superconducting qubits uh, in fact behave like artificial atoms. And not only that, they can be used for exploring the quantum properties of circuit resonators. Okay? So this is the field of circuit quantum electrodynamics, where uh, artificial atoms like these superconducting charge qubits have been used to manipulate and measure number states and various other non-classical states of, of electromagnetic resonators. And so this is important for our, us in mechanics, our field. Uh, for one, it shows that you know, superconducting qubits, the analogy between them and atomic systems is, is good, and it's not unreasonable for us to expect that we could use these systems as tools to manipulate and measure our mechanical resonators. And two, there's an entire decade of technology and know-how that's been developed that we can import into our field uh, to use for our measurements. Okay. And so this is what we've, we've started to do, going back about six or seven years now. And so the first um, example of a quantum bit integrated with a mechanical device 
It's a system that uh, my colleagues and I developed when I was a postdoc at, um, at Caltech. And this, it was an example. In this example, we actually used a charge qubit, a Cooper pair box charge qubit, which again, I'll give the say more about the details of it in a second. We uh, integrated it with a flexural nanomechanical device. And in these experiments, the nanomechanical device was purely in a classical limit. We drove it to really high amplitude, you know, thousands of phonons. Uh, but what we showed was that an interaction arises between these two systems that's analogous to uh, so-called dispersive interactions in atomic physics that have been used for doing things like generating Schrodinger cat states of an atom in a cavity. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Shortly after our result, um, or is the work from Andrew Cleveland's group from UC Santa Barbara that I mentioned before, and not only did they cool one of these mechanical resonators down into the quantum regime, they also interfaced it with a superconducting qubit, and they were able to do some really amazing experiments where, for instance, they would prepare the qubit in its excited state, so they'd put a quantum of energy in, in the qubit, then they'd bring it into resonance with the mechanical device, and then they would measure over time as the two systems swap that quantum of energy uh, back and forth between each other. So this was the first um, conclusive demonstration of energy quantization in a micromechanical mode. And they also did so, uh, some more sophisticated measurements, which I won't get into the details of, but they actually looked at how a superposition state of this system actually lost its phase coherence. And so these were the first measurements of the decoherence time of a micromechanical mode. One other result that I should point out, using a, a qubit and a mechanical resonator, was this work from a group in Finland from a couple of years ago and they actually uh, demonstrated an effect that was complementary to the effect that we showed back in 2009. Their results in their work, they showed that the transition energy of the qubit, the energy between the ground state and the excited state, uh, when they established a particular interaction between the systems, that transition energy became dependent on the number of quanta in the mechanics. And so they, the, more, the harder they drove their mechanical device, the greater the transition energy of the, of the qubit became. Right? And again, in their result, their mechanical device was driven to very high amplitude, so that it was safely in the classical regime. But in principle, this so-called, this sort of mechanical Stark shift could be used for, for many kinds of different uh, advanced quantum measurements. Okay. All right, so one of the things to point out, though, is on this slide here, uh, these are, it's really the sum total of the experimental work that's been done with these systems. Uh, we've only really begun to scratch the, the surface. And there's a laundry list of possibilities uh, that we could realize if we develop the system further. And so that's what we're trying to do at, at Syracuse now. And so what I'll do is uh, spend the, the remainder of the talk, plus about 15 minutes, talking about our efforts. So the kind of system that we're developing, and what I've worked on previously uh, as a postdoc, was uh, based upon a Cooper pair box charge qubit, or CBB charge qubit. And so what I'll do now is just give you some background information about this system and how we also couple it to a mechanical device. And so I have a schematic here of showing you know, a system similar to what we work with. Our nano resonator is illustrated by this structure here. Okay, and this light blue is to denote aluminum. That's a metal that we typically use. At the temperatures that we work, it's superconducting. Sometimes there's a dielectric layer underneath these, which is either silicon nitride or silicon. The mode that we're typically interested in of this nanostructure is the in-plane fundamental flexural mode, so the mode with an anti-node at the center here. Okay. The mechanical element is we fabricate it using nanofabrication techniques uh, to be in close proximity to the, our CBB qubit, our charge qubit here. And by close proximity, I mean on the order of 100 nanometers, 50 to 100 nanometers. Okay, and so the, the qubit, the CBB, it consists of this strip, this microscopic strip or island of aluminum that's also superconducting at the temperatures we work with. And that strip is um, isolated from some leads with a couple of Joseph's injunctions. Okay. And the important thing about this island here is that it's microscopic. So it has a really small capacitance. So it costs a lot of energy for charges, namely Cooper pairs, to tunnel from these leads onto the island here. Okay. So it really is energetically costly for charges to tunnel across these, these junctions here. And so because of that, we can accurately model the electrostatics of this system as a two-level charge state, say n and n plus one charges. And so what I mean is if you prepare this island so that it has n charges or n Cooper pairs on it, it's energetically unfavorable for it to tunnel to n plus two or n plus three. You only really have to worry about it tunneling back and forth between n and n plus one. Okay. So that's 
so because of this, we can model the system, this qubit, as a two-level quantum system, and we can use the, the normal language of, uh, that you use for two-level quantum systems, namely the Pauli operators, to model a, a Hamiltonian description of that system, where the diagonal elements here represent the electrostatic energy of the n and n plus one charge states of that ion. Now, the, uh, it turns out that the charge states of the system, uh, it's not the, the full story, they're not stationary states of the system. They actually get mixed by uh, the Josephson coupling of the, the leads in the island here. Basically, the, way, the overlap, the wave functions of the leads in the islands. It promotes mixing of those charge states. Okay? So you actually see oscillations between n and n plus 1. So to account for that, uh, just you know, represent the mixing in the usual way that it's done for two-level systems using poly uh, sigma x matrix. Okay? The one other thing I need to note about the qubit that's important is that we can tune these two characteristic energy scales, both the electrostatic energy and this Josephson mixing, by either adjusting a, a voltage that we apply in a nearby electrode here, or by adjusting the magnetic field that we apply to the qubit. Okay? So we have experimental handles that, or knobs that we can tune uh, in situ to change those two energies. Okay, to, to finish modeling the system, presume that we can model the nano resonator as a quantum harmonic oscillator and use the usual uh, creation and annihilation operators to represent its displacement and energy. And then finally, the interaction between the two systems. The way we establish the interaction is to apply a large vo DC voltage between the, the structure and the qubit here. And then when this thing flexes in plane, that changes the capacitance between the two metals here. And through this large voltage, then, that modifies the charge on this island. So what you can do is you can expand the electrostatic energy here for small displacement of the structure, and you get a really simple uh, interaction between the two systems that basically goes as a displacement of the mechanical device, A dagger plus A, times the charge on the, the qubit, sigma Z, and then times some proportionality constant, which is given by both the voltage and then some geometric parameters. So at the end of the day, you get this really simple Hamiltonian with four terms that we use to try and model the system here. And I, I've always found this um, to be amazing because you know you have it, this system is a rather complicated system with coupled mechanical and electronic degrees of freedom, uh, representing the motion of billions of atoms in the structure here and the motion of billions of charges in your electrical circuit here. But at the end of the day, you can reduce this to something that's uh, got four terms. Anyways. This is a, the more important point in regard for this talk is that this Hamiltonian is formally analogous to a famous Hamiltonian in cavity QED quantum optics called the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And so this is the formal connection or the formal analogy that I mentioned before between a qubit coupled nano resonator and uh, an atom coupled to a microwave cavity or an artificial atom coupled to a circuit resonator. And you know, I've, I've skipped a lot of details, obviously, in deriving this. If you're interested in reading more, this, this paper from uh, Keith Schwab and Eleanor Irish is actually really accessible. It's a, it's a nice paper from PRB in 2004. And you can read more about details of this James Cummings Hamiltonian in uh, Sarah J. Roche's book, Exploring the Quantum. What I want to focus on um, is the question of how do you use this, this system, then, to observe some kind of quantum properties of the mechanical element. To answer that question, I'm going to focus on a, a particular limit that's relevant for the systems that we developed called the dispersive coupling limit. Okay? So in this limit, the coupling strength, that lambda that I mentioned before, the electrostatic coupling, is usually less than the detuning and energy between the two systems, the qubit and the, the harmonic oscillator. So lambda is on the order of megahertz, transition energy to the qubit on the order of gigahertz, mega frequency of the mechanics is hundreds of megahertz, tens of megahertz. In this limit, the two systems don't resonantly swap energy with each other, right? They don't, they don't resonantly interact, but they still interact. And the effect of the interaction is just to shift the energies of the two systems, okay? And what's important is that the energies are shifted in, a, in such a way that the energy of each system shifts depending upon the state of the other system. So let me give you an example. So from the perspective of the harmonic oscillator, the mechanical resonator, its energy, or its frequency, increases if the qubit's in the excited state and decreases if the qubit's in the ground state. That's the plus and minus sign there. So you can look at this schematically by looking at the energy levels, the energy spectrum for the system. If the ground state of the qubit, excited state of the qubit, 
and then the harmonic oscillator energy levels for both cases. So I'm just drawing the energy spectrum here for the qubit and the nano resonator. This is without the interaction on. If you turn on the interaction, what you see is that if the qubit if, is in the ground state, then the harmonic oscillator energy levels get compressed. So the frequency, it's like the frequency decreasing. If the qubit's in the excited state, the harmonic oscillator levels get pulled apart. Frequency increases. This effect, as I've said before, is analogous to the sort of dispersive single atom index of refractive shift in cavity QED. This is also the effect that my colleagues and I measured when I was a postdoc. At the time, we measured that in the classical limit. But in principle, if you develop this technique further, you could use it to prepare uh, like superposition states of the mechanics. For example, you can imagine preparing your atom or your qubit in a superposition of ground and excited state, which is readily done. And then you bring that, you couple that atom to your mechanical device, and over time your mechanical element will evolve into a superposition of states where it's oscillating at two different frequencies based upon this shift, these shifts here. Okay. So that's the kind of experiment we'd like to do in the future. It hasn't been done yet, but there's a proposal you can read about how to do that there. You can also look at this interaction from the perspective of the qubit, because transition energy becomes de linearly dependent on the number of quantum mechanics. This is that mechanical start shift that I mentioned before. Okay. And this, this effect, you can understand from this effect you know, how you would actually, for example, measure a particular number state of your mechanical device. You could do spectroscopy of your qubit and measure the transition energy, and then from that measured transition energy, infer the number state of the mechanical system. This is the kind of experiment that we're trying to do. We've been building up to doing that at Syracuse. And one of the reasons we're interested in it, this is kind of technical, but one of the reasons we're interested in this is because you can show that this interaction here can be represented by a Hamiltonian like this, which has a nice property that it commutes with the bare Hamiltonian of the system. And so, you know, again, this is technical, but this is a, one of the conditions for being able to perform a, a quantum non-demolition measurement of the energy in the mechanical mode. So if this technique, was developed further, we developed this interaction, really, really be able to control it. In principle, we could use it to non-destructively measure the energy of a mode of a, like a macroscopic structure, basically. And so this is what I was mentioning before about possibilities for exploring how energy is transferred and converted between optical and electronic domain, or mechanical and electronic domains within a nanostructure. We want to use this kind of effect here. Okay, so um, one of the important things about this device is that it should enable us to get into the so-called strong dispersive limit. And that's a lot of jargon, but this, what the strong dispersive limit means is that this, the Stark shift, this mechanical Stark shift, should be larger than the line width of the qubit energy transition. If these individual Stark shifts, these, the chi here, is larger than the transition, the line width of the transition, then we should be able to resolve those shifts. Okay? And so the way we would do this experiment we couple our nano resonator to the qubit by applying this large DC voltage. We perform some readout of the, the qubit, and at the same time apply a spectroscopy tone microwaves that excite it from its ground state to its excited state. So we would sweep that spectroscopy tone, and we'd see these peaks then in the absorption spectrum where the qubit absorbs in microwaves, corresponding to these different transitions here that are indexed by these different number states, n equals zero, one, two, et cetera. Okay. And so this, this, uh, this plot at the bottom here, this is a simulation uh, that we did for, uh, that was based upon some analytical expressions from that paper at the bottom. But the important thing to point out about this, this plot here is that the simulation was done assuming a thermal resonator. So we were assuming our mechanical device was not in its quantum ground state. We were assuming that there were about two phonons of thermal energy in, in this mechanical device. And so what you actually see here in the absorption spectrum is not a pure number state it, you see a reflection of the Bose-Einstein distribution of number states that you would expect for that thermal distribution. Okay. But nonetheless, you would be resolving these individual number states, which would be a, the first step in demonstrating you know, this, this Stark shift effect. Okay, so one of the things I should say, I'm running out of time. So um, the, one of the challenges in doing this experiment for us has been to develop the qubit readout. We've actually gone through several generations of this. And um, I'll share with you, uh, I think what I'll probably do is actually skip through the first three generations. And um, let, me, let me explain how the first generation worked, and that will um, motivate the, the final generation. So what we wanted to do in the first generations of devices, going back 
about two and a half, three years ago, was take our qubit coupled nano resonator and embed it in a superconducting LC circuit. And we did this, uh, and the way this would work then is that we'd arrange things so that the qubit would be capacitively coupled to the LC circuit through this capacitor here, so that the LC circuit frequency would depend upon the state of the qubit. So if the qubit was in the ground state, LC circuit would oscillate at a little bit lower frequency than if the qubit was in the excited state. Okay. And so then what we could do is provide microwaves through this, what I'm calling a feed line here, do transmission measurements of this guy. And where we saw a dip in that transmission, the frequency at which we saw a dip in that transmission, that would tell us the oscillation frequency, of the LC circuit, which would tell us the state of the qubit, which we then could use to learn about the state of the nano resonator. So it's like four levels of detection here. Qubits read out the nano resonator, LC circuit to read out the qubit, feed line to read out the LC circuit. Okay. Um, for reasons I won't get into, it turned out we were able to, we were able to use the LC circuit to, and, and perform measurements of the state of the qubit, read out its energy state. Uh, so we could do spectroscopy of the qubit using this technique. And a spectroscopy, uh, this is actually the results of doing spectroscopy at many different values of magnetic flux applied to the qubit. Okay, and so the, the x-axis here is magnetic flux. The y-axis here is the microwave spectroscopy frequency, which we're using to interrogate the qubit. Where you see blue here, that tells you that for a given value of magnetic flux, the frequency at which the qubit absorbs those microwaves. Okay? So what the envelope of this data here shows is the transition energy of the qubit as a function of magnetic flux. And the important thing to take away is that it agrees with what we expect based upon the qubit's uh, energy dependence on magnetic flux. And so what we wanted to do after doing this, showing that, okay, we can read out the transition energy of our qubit using our LC circuit, we want to do is zoom in on the spectroscopy plot and see those individual phonon start shifts, evidence of this dispersive coupling. But what you can see here is that there's a lot of extra structure besides this uh, parabolic curve here. In fact, if you zoom in, you see that this extra structure is actually like a lot of little avoided level crossings. And you know, to make a long story short, what actually we we aren't sure what these the spurious, these, these extra features were in the data. We know for sure that they weren't the, the phonon start shift, the mechanical start shift. We think that they were due to a more conflict, the fact that we, our, our microwave circuitry for the measurement was actually fairly complicated, at least in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum on the chip. So there were all these higher order modes that could have been interacting with the qubit and giving us these really weird features here. So what we decided to do for the next generation of devices was to integrate this mechanics in the qubit into a more uh, clean environment using a, simple, a, a simpler electromagnetic system, uh, namely a coplanar waveguide microwave capping. And I'm going to skip generations two and three here, where we work through details of, of that system. But where we are right now is we've actually embedded, uh, there we go. We've actually embedded the qubit coupled nano resonator, shown here, inside the ground plane of this transmission line or coplanar waveguide cavity. So what this is, you can see this little strip here, just strip of superconducting metal that snakes around on the surface here. It's 11 millimeters long. Uh, it has a couple capacitors, one at the input here and one at the output, which define boundary conditions, which give a, a microwave mode inside here that's on the order of five gigahertz. So there's actually a microwave mode on this little 1D cavity here. We can use that to interrogate the state of our qubit which is shown here, which again we're trying to use to read out the state of the, the dispersive interaction with the mechanics. Okay, and so where we stand right now is actually we've fully developed this. It's taken several years to develop this design, integrate the mechanics and the qubit into it, and we're starting now to actually turn on again the interaction between the qubit and the mechanical device to start to look for uh, behavior both in the time domain of, of the qubit uh, and in spectroscopy data signatures of the coupling with the mechanics. So I think, without saying much more, I'll skip through this. Um, so I guess the point, the point is, is that you know, we have things, we haven't yet seen this dispersive st mechanical start shift of the qubit energies yet, but um, we're, we're getting to the point now where I, I'm hoping this summer or later on this spring we, we should actually, actually see. Um, so let me just say that the, the kind of system that we're, we're developing, as Siwan mentioned in the beginning, is can be thought of as a hybrid 
quantum system. And so hybrid quantum systems, there's been a lot of buzz about these systems. It's essentially where people are taking different kinds of quantum devices, quantum systems, and integrating them together for various uh, new applications. And so mechanical elements have now entered that mix. In addition to our work with integrating mechanics with a superconducting qubit, other groups are integrating mechanics with individual spins, both nuclear, small groups of nuclear spins and individual electronic spins. Groups are integrating mechanics with atomic systems, quantum optical systems, et cetera. And what's, what's really interesting to me is that now that mechanical devices have entered the quantum regime, people are starting to see signatures of this non-classical behavior. It's like we have a complete toolbox of different kinds of quantum systems uh, that we can integrate in with each other for developing new, new technologies. And I, I don't know where all this technology will go. Some people suggest that there's a, a new revolution in quantum mechanics, a revolution of engineered quantum systems that are going to usher in all kinds of new technologies. That isn't clear. And, you know, and some people even suggest that fully you know, operational, uh, coherent quantum mechanical machines aren't too far on the corner. Um, again, I, you know, these, who knows what the future brings. But certainly, there's a lot of exciting possibilities with these systems for a number of different research areas. And so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. We have time for you know, a few questions. No question? Uh, I have a question for you. So, you know, in the in the why you should you know buy you know use SP to you know click the and yeah. group, right? That that how how did that excite the dialect you know, you know mode? Because that's six categories is pretty hard to do with the mechanical Yeah, so they right? actually looked at I mean they would do uh PA, to, to look at the classical regime they had a piezo disk, I think, on the, the sample, the they shake it, I think that actually drive it through the resonance to see that, they, okay, the resonance is there. So they actually measure the resonance classically. And, but then to show that the, the thermal occupation of that mode, they did was they prepared the qubit in its excited state and brought it into what they thought was resonance with the, the mechanics. And then they measured the relaxation time of the qubit. And then based upon the measured relaxation time, they were able to put an upper bound on what the, the number state of, of the, uh, of the, Sorry, actually it was the opposite. They had the qubit in the ground state, brought it to resonance with the mechanics, and then they were able to look to measure. Right, and it would have been thermally excited quantum from the mechanical one into the qubit. So based upon, they would do measurements of the population of the excited state. So, so the mechanical oscillator that you showed on your last slide, uh -huh. right? I mean the, the one we made. Yeah, what, what is that in the, what is the most true Yeah, one? so that, it's, okay, so one of the details of this is that, um, we're actually going to try and move beyond the fundamental mode frequency. So the fundamental mode of this device would have, you know, where you have an anti-node here in the, in the center, that would have a frequency, we think, of around 600 megahertz. And we actually think we've measured that. Um, the third mode of that structure would have a frequency of around 3 gigahertz or 3.5 gigahertz. And the coupling between the higher order modes, like the third mode, and the, the, tr the trans one, the qubit there, actually doesn't die off very quickly. So we, what we hope is that the, we should be able to see the coupling between the third mode and the trans. And the reason for this is technical. The third mode, again, it's because it's three gigahertz, be closer to the energy of the qubit. And so the dispersive interaction should be larger because the detuning will be smaller. Good. Good. Any question? No, let's send our speaker again.